Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Is everybody happy to be here this morning? Amen. Awake, alive, perhaps. It's always good to wake up in the morning, even if you don't like mornings. It's good to wake up. Amen. I'm thankful that the Lord let us be here this morning. I'm thankful for each and every one of you. Um, I'm looking forward to this afternoon. I pray for our house. Uh, hope everybody can make it. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to sing a couple of songs this morning. I have, if y'all will pray for me, I have been having a lot of pain in my legs, so I'm not very peppy this morning because I woke up awful this morning, so you guys would just pray for me this morning. Lord, we ask that you would reach down and touch today, God. We ask that you would move in this place, Lord. We ask that you would anoint, God. Lord, we ask that you would come into this place and make us different than we came, Lord. God, we ask that you would help us, Lord, to worship you with everything that we have, with our whole hearts, oh God. Send your word today, God, and anoint it, Lord. Help us, Lord, to apply it to our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
verse, it says, I believe that you're my healer. I believe that you're all I need. Amen. I believe that you're my portion. That's talking about the Bible where people were given parts of their inheritance. You know, their inheritance was, was something significant. Well, Jesus is our inheritance. Amen. Jesus is all we need. He's everything that we need. He will take care of us in every moment. He's going to calm the raging seas. He's going to walk with us through fires. Whenever we're having problems, whenever we have trials, whenever we have situations, whenever we have disease, he's going to be there with us. He's going to walk with us. We're never going to be alone, and I thank him for that.
Christ, He can cancel deployment orders. Then He can cancel PCS orders. Amen. Amen. The Bible does say that He'll give you the desires of your heart. Amen. Amen. He does. Amen. Uh, think about that. That's a blessing. Amen. What a blessing. If you want something down deep in your heart, and it's, it's not contrary to the Word of God and the will of God, God says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Amen. We just got to believe. Amen. God has a way of coming through. Anybody else want to give God glory before we get into the Word? Anybody else? Sister Elizabeth, I can see it all over your face right there, hidden under that mask. Say something for the Lord. talking to me and my brother about that, she wasn't really sure that we were around them, and so she just wanted to quarantine us just for our safety, so that we wouldn't be around those people, and I just want to thank God that I haven't shown any symptoms, and I am healthy as I have ever been, and my teachers have been really kind to me, and they've been very helping towards my online schooling now, and I just want to thank God that they're not like most teachers and give me a cold at the end. Amen. <laughs> Amen. That gets back to the desires of your heart again, doesn't it? <laughs> Lord, deliver me from the spirit of homework. Praise God. Anybody else to give you an opportunity? And the reason we do this is because this is what they did in the book of Acts. Yeah. They went house to house. They had fellowship like we're going to have here after church. We're inviting everybody to come over. We're going to pray over our house and we're going to Roast hot dogs and marshmallows and make s'mores and just fellowship for a little bit over the fire pit and just have a good time. Uh, they prayed together, they worshiped God together, and they shared their testimonies. And the Bible said that God gave them tremendous revival. The book of Revelation says that we overcome our enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And so your testimony matters. Sometimes you may think, that what you have to say may seem insignificant, it may not uh, be a big deal, but I'm here to tell you there's power in you verbalizing your testimony. Amen. The Bible tells us that life and death are in the power of the tongue. And if, if we can ever get this revelation, it will transform uh, not only our mindset, but our entire lives. The things that come out of our mouth really dictate our current and future situations. If we, wait, if we wake up in the morning and we begin to say things like, uh, this is going to be a horrible day, you know, I'm sick, uh, I've got so much going on, I'm so stressed out, nothing's going right, you have just set the stage for your That's entire right. day. That's right. God has given you that creative power and ability. Yes, he has. And so sometimes I think that we nonchalantly uh, utter words to our own detriment. We create storms by what we vocalize and we don't even realize it. And then we sit back and wonder, why is all this happening to me? It's because you created it. You spoke it into existence. That's why the Bible focuses so much on vocalizing your praise. Everything that hath breath, praise ye the Lord. And so we are called to be praisers and worshipers of God. Instead of focusing on our problem, if we focus on the problem solver, and we vocalize that. We say, you know what? I was going through this, but, but God. I was facing this, but God. That's right. I was going through this situation, but God. Amen. 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 When we begin to vocalize our praise and our worship, and we share that testimony, no matter how seemingly small it may seem to somebody else, you have an overcoming power. That's right. Not only for yourself, but somebody else can be edified and encouraged by your testimony. Amen. So the reason we do testimonies uh, is, is for that reason. It's part of apostolic praise and worship. A lot of churches, you may not be aware of this, but uh, you stick around long enough as you visit other churches, especially larger churches, uh, they don't do testimony services anymore. They kind of excused it away by saying, well, uh, there's just too many people to allow that, and you never know what people are going to say, so we got to kind of control all of that. And they'll say, if you have a specific testimony, fill out this little card and hand it to the usher when they take up offering. And then the praise 
uh, and worship leader will read it to the congregation. That's not the same thing. A praise report is not the same thing as a personal testimony. And nobody can tell your testimony like you can. Right. Right. Amen. So as long as I'm pastor, as long as I'm breathing, we're going to do testimonies because there's overcoming power in that. Amen. 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 I have another one. Go ahead, sister. <laughs> okay, so people would never, never think that the big store would need help, but it actually it does. Um, because it, it was when we started this week, actually. They are short-handed, and it's incredible the amount of people who calls in. And me and these other two people are the only ones who are consistent showing up. And I said, oh my goodness, whenever I pray to be helpful somewhere, I never thought it would be on this specific store. But right now, this week, it's last week, I started count, uh, singing from the top of my lungs in the cooler. <laughs> Praising right. God and stuff. And people just walk in, walk out, and I said, you know what, if I keep singing, that tune is going to be stuck in their mind, and whenever they realize, they will be singing themselves, too, the same thing. Amen. And I said, that's so freaking cool. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, well, we're not going to do, oh, Brother Nicholas has one. All right. So, I was at school, I was shooting some hoops with my bro. And, uh, Doing so what? Shoot some hoops. Ah, okay. Uh. And so the ball got stuck in the hoop, and we didn't have another ball to take it out. And so we sat around, and we were like, oh, yeah. we can't get the ball out. And then the ball just popped out of nowhere. We're like, whoa, what's this? <laughs> so, you know, I don't know, but. Was Jesus kicking the ball back to you guys? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Right. That's actually pretty cool. <laughs> Amen. Well, I've got to share this one before we get into the word. Uh, you can ask my wife. I kept telling her this last night repeatedly. I was like, I don't know how this is happening, but it's happening. I have a laptop that I, back when I was going to Cameron University, uh, a minute or two ago, <laughs> uh -huh. I, had, I had invested quite a bit of money on a gaming laptop because of the types of, uh, I was in uh, an accounting program and a lot of the things that they had us was very draining on the processor. So I, I invested quite a chunk of change on a gaming laptop because it was smoking fast. And uh, about four or five years ago, one of the kids tripped over the power cord while I was working uh, on, my, on my laptop on the chair and it pulled something on the inside and it would never turn on again. And I was like, no. <laughs> Not only did I pour a whole bunch of money into this laptop, I'm, I'm talking, this is probably like four times the, the cost of a normal laptop. And um, it had home videos of my dad and of various family members that do not exist anywhere else on planet Earth. That I had uh, extrapolated from these old things called VHS tapes <laughs> and converted them over into digital files, and I had saved them down, and that's the only place that they exist. And I have tried, I've, I've taken it to computer technicians, and nobody could get this thing uh, to work. Everyone would just tell me, Well, sorry about your luck, you're just gonna have to go buy another one. That's all I can tell you. Last night, as we were uh, unpacking and decorating, I I uh, pulled my old laptop out of the garage and I looked at it and I said, man, I sure wish this thing would work. And I uh, unplugged the lamp and I plugged it in and I opened the, the lid and it was already on and it was updating Windows 10. And I was like, how in the world? And what blew my mind of all of that, this thing has never been turned on in over four years, much less connected to our current internet. But it was updating, and for two hours, it pushed all the updates. And then I played on that thing for about two hours and uh, tested out a web camera. We were going to use it this morning to live stream on our YouTube channel. I thought, how in the world is this happening? And I said, this has to be a God thing. This has it to be, is. you know. Uh, and then I did something stupid. I said, well, it came on. Maybe it's fixed. 
So I'm going to power it down and see if it will power back up and it won't come back on now. So, <laughs> But God can do it again. Amen. And it comes on, I'm going to leave it plugged in and never turn it back off. Praise the Lord. Amen. But I, that was awesome. I got to go back and watch a few videos, home videos, my dad. Did you share it to your email? Uh, I, I shared it on our uh, new uh, channel there on My Liberty page. Okay. Yeah. So that was exciting. So uh, I know now uh, the issue lies in the power button. Amen. Sometimes you got to fix things. Uh, so I just thought that was pretty exciting. That had to been a God thing for something to push up base that wasn't even connected to the internet. Matter of fact, when it got to the desktop, it had been so long, I was like, I don't even know my PIN number. And I had to sit there and reset and sit there and reset and sit there and reset. After about 20 minutes, I finally guessed it right, got to the desktop, and sure enough, it was not connected to the internet, and I said, how did it just push Windows 10, which took over two hours, but God blessed, and I believe he can turn it back on again, amen, because yeah, that will be a valuable SMS to us here at the church, uh, it's, it's really fast, even as old as it is, it is really fast, and it will meet all of our church needs, amen, someone say praise the Lord, praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, why don't you stand with and go with me to 1 Timothy chapter number 6. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. And then I'm also going to read from Luke chapter number 17. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and Luke chapter number 17. Amen. I know that uh, Sister Rickard has some friends and relatives and folks in Kentucky that have been following our live stream services. Do let them know we're not on Facebook uh, anymore. So this morning we're live streaming on in our Instagram. It's gpack underscore Lawton. Uh, but we'll, we'll be doing it straight on YouTube once I can get the computer back on. And he was ready to go last night, I tell you. It was working perfect. Next time, don't turn off. That's right. Keep it on. Keep it on. <laughs> 1 Timothy chapter 6, and then we're going to go to Luke chapter 17. If you're there, say praise the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord. Lord. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and starting with verse number 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith Content. Somebody say content. content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. How many knows that chasing money and chasing possessions can hurt you? Which drown men in destruction and perdition. Man, that is a powerful verse of scripture, isn't it? For the love of money is the root of all evil. While some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith. You know that money can mess up your walk with God. Yeah. Amen. Chasing things can mess up your walk with God. Paul told Timothy that some of these people have had a love for money and their pursuit of it had caused them to err from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows verses 9 and 10 that's, that's pretty heavy pretty deep isn't it chasing the things that this world has to offer possessions things money it can hurt you and it can mess you up it's not money that's evil it's the love of it it's it's the constant pursuit of ne never being enough so Paul tells us to be content. Luke chapter number 17 and verse number 11. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers which stood afar off. And while they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus... Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that 
as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. And fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. Someone say thanks. thanks. And he was a Samaritan. He wasn't even one of God's people. And Jesus answering said, "Where were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. With the help of the Lord for a few minutes today, I want to preach to us on this thought. Unplug yourself so that you can get plugged in. Amen. Amen. Unplug yourself so that you can get plugged in. Let's lift our hands and ask the Lord to help us. Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you, Lord, for these wonderful testimonies of how you're working and moving, operating in our lives. We thank you for the wonderful things that you have done. We thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do here in this service. We ask you, Lord, to pour out your spirit in this place. We will minister. Lord, we're asking you to touch every heart, every life, every need. Lord, let your anointing rest upon me, God, for without you I can do nothing. I ask you, Lord, to preach through me. Speak to me and through me, Lord. Confirm your word, Lord, with the demonstration of your spirit. Lord, let us leave changed by the power of your word and spirit. Lord, we thank you for it. We give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. In Jesus' name. Amen. Unplug yourself so that you can get plugged in. Amen. We live in a world of constant distractions. Amen. This world is a lot different than the world that I grew up in. I did not grow up with the internet. I did not grow up with cell phones. This might uh, amuse you younger folks, but uh, it used to be in the 80s, the only people that had a, what you would call a mobile phone, and it was a car phone, it was a giant, dinosaur-looking, ugly, hideous contraption that had to plug into your phone, and you had to have a special antenna to pro, uh, you know, broadcast and try to get a signal, and uh, there was more dead spots than there was good signal strength. Uh, but only the wealthy, only the affluent, only the prestigious, and those with, with some, some dough, those with some money could afford those kinds. A lot of money. It cost a lot of money. And I thought about that this morning while I was taking a jet cold shower. Our hot water heater kicked off and we were trying to mess with it. I got to mess with it when I get back home. And uh, we didn't know that the hot water had kicked off in the middle of the night. So there was no hot water this morning. I was in there freezing. And I was, uh, my mind had gone back to Camp Casey, Korea. When they had sent us over there. A specific mission and some training, and uh, it, was, it was October, not November time frame, and it was it was bitter cold. They already had snow on the ground, and the showers had no hot water. And I remember taking a shower in these places. You had to push the button in, and then you had to stand back and let the water squirt on you, and you were freezing to death. And then the button would slowly push out, and then you had to push the button in again. And let the water sprinkle on you some more. You learned real quick how to take like 60 second showers. Because you just couldn't take it. You kept thinking, my lungs are going to explode. My heart is going to burst. I can't take this. I'm going to go into uh, pneumonia. And, and uh, you know, I'm going to freeze to death. And as I was taking a cold shower this morning, my mind went back to that. And, and then all of a sudden, God dropped a thought in my, in my heart. That we need to get plugged into him. And we need to unplug some from some other things. In the 80s, it really was those with money. And, and really a lot of uh, means that could afford these hideous looking mobile phones. That uh, you could only use in your car. And like I said, you had to have these special antennas to get a signal. and But only the affluent could afford them. But really not much has changed. Because you see, people don't realize it now because they just they charge you differently than they did back then. Now back then you had to buy the device outright, but now you get to finance it 
on a monthly plan and then incorporate it into your monthly bill with your data plan and, and uh, they tell you, oh, it's only $100 for four lines and praise God, glory to God, hallelujah. And then you get your first month's bill and it's $480 and you're like, what? And the next month, and they say, oh, well, your first bill is always a little bit higher and the next month it's $350 and it stays $350. For like 48 months, you're like, well, I thought you said $100. Yeah, but that doesn't count this and this and this and this and this. I just finished paying off our four cell phones this past week. And we were under the impression my daughter's had gotten broken. And her grandma took her to the Verizon store and, and bought her phone outright. We were under the impression that it was completely bought and paid for. No. Nope. We were still paying 30 something, 40 something dollars a month on a cell phone that we thought was paid off. So let me tell you, they're still getting your money. That's right. And they, they just take it over time. And then the reason I went ahead and paid off our cell phones is because they're trying to crash our phones. They're becoming almost inoperational. And uh, AT&T about three years ago got sued by hundreds of uh, customers for that. Uh, they sent out a thing in the mail to everybody that if you were an AT&T customer and you would like to join and be part of this lawsuit uh, to send in this information and they needed this and this because they're going after AT&T for ripping people off because they proved that uh, uh, when you got close to the end of your contract or data plan, they would intentionally crash your devices. They would stop pushing updates and it would start freezing up and not working which would highly encourage you to go buy another phone. And so the, the cycle of debt just continues on. It never ends. So while we look in the 80s and we say, man, those things were expensive, you're still paying for them in the year 2020. If you were to go out and buy an iPhone right off the shelf, right out of the box today, don't matter the carrier, you're going to go buy the latest and greatest iPhone. I don't even know what version it is right now. It's going to cost you anywhere between twelve and fifteen hundred dollars plus tax. That's not even a data plan. That's just the cost of the device. Now they're going to tell you when you walk into the store. Oh, well, you know what? We're going to give you this great big discount just for signing up and switching over, and we're going to give you this for three hundred dollars. What they're not telling you is they're going to get the rest of that money over the over a period of time. They're going to. Slam that into your bill. So you're still paying for it. The world I grew up in is quite different than the world these young people grew up in because we didn't have Xboxes and, and uh, Google. Google. The internet didn't exist. <laughs> How many of y'all knew the government invented the internet? You do. know that? The government invented the internet. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. And uh, anything that the government ever touches... They think it belongs to them forever. That's why they don't feel bad about spying on you and infringing on your privacy because they're like, we built it. It's ours to do with as we please. But they'll look at you in the face and they'll sit in front of Congress and say, oh, we don't know what you're talking about. But yes, they're spying on you. If you doubt that today, I'd encourage you to take your cell phone or your iPad and and while you're uh, surfing whatever social media platform you, you choose, whether it be Facebook or whatever, uh, just kind of speak real loud, as close as you can, to the face of, of that device and start talking about something specific. Maybe say, camping gear. And I'm not talking about talking to Siri. Just start talking about it. It won't be about 15 minutes and you're going to start seeing ads. Whew, camping gear. Oh, tents. Sleeping bags. And all of this, because they're spying on you. It's a scam to try to get you to spend your money and stay in a cycle of debt. That's why Paul told Timothy, it's the love of money, the love of things. That's the root of all evil. Because it's never enough. You, you're never satisfied. You're always chasing the latest and the greatest. You're always chasing that next thing. You're like, well, I've got the iPhone... 200, and they just came out with the iPhone 201. So I've got to have it because it's got, you know, it's got this extra feature that mine doesn't have. And people walk around in life thinking like that. I've got to have the next one. 
I've got to have it because it's got this and mine doesn't have that. And so they're constantly in pursuit of the latest and the greatest. And what is happening is they're operating in a discontent spirit. That they're not pleased, they're not content, they're not happy enough with what they have at the moment. They got to have more. They got to have better. And they're constantly chasing that. And what that is, that is a spirit of unthankfulness. That is a discontent heart. That's right. Paul said it's a trap. He said if you find yourself in that and you're saying, well, I've got this, but I really want something better. I really want something nicer. I really want something more, uh, more attractive. I want something more expensive. And you, can't, you find yourself chasing these things. He said it's like arrows that's going to pierce you through to many sorrows. You're going to find yourself drowning in debt to where you will never get out. Your great-grandkids will be paying your credit card bills. Newsflash, I want to tell you kids something right now. I don't have a credit card. Praise God. Now, that's a testimony. Let me tell you something. We don't have them either anymore. Anymore. We got rid of them suckers. Let me tell you something. Don't you let anybody give you a credit card or sell you on saying, oh, you need to sign up right here. Because it's a cycle of debt that you would never get out of. That's right. They start off for a certain period of time. They might even go for one year and say, no interest. As long as you make your monthly payments. At the end of that one year, they jack it up to like 34% interest. Compound interest at that. And all of a sudden, you're like, why is, my, my, why is this card bill $200 a month? And, the, and you, you struggle to pay that. And then all of a sudden, it jumps to $360 and $400. you are like, how in the world? How in the world? Let me tell you something. The best way to navigate life is to do this. You see something you want. Save up your money and go buy it. Mm -hmm. That's right. Plastic is not the answer. Right. A That's line right. of credit is not the answer. Charging it for a future day. No, save your money and then go buy it. Don't allow anybody to pull you in to this cycle of debt. Because what you're going to find is that uh, it's the gift that keeps on giving. You're going to keep on giving them your money. And by law, I don't know if you're aware of this, by law, let's say I had a credit card. Let's say I had $5,000 debt on that credit card. And I die this afternoon. My wife automatically inherits that debt. They will start coming after her for that debt. Unless you have paid a specific insurance on that credit card, which adds to your monthly bill, to automatically pay off the remaining balance. If you have not selected that, and most people don't, then it defers to your next of kin. Now, if something were to happen to my wife, my kids automatically inherit that debt. It just goes into a frozen period of time, but as soon as Elizabeth turns 18 next month, guess what? She inherits my debt, even though she had nothing to do with my charges. Did you all know that? Wow. That's the law. So, credit cards, all that, that, that's, that's no way to go. That's no way to live. I know people that live off of credit cards. That, that's how they, they exist. They do everything. They vacation. They eat. They buy their groceries. Everything off credit cards. Everything off credit cards. And what happens is they're so bottom side up that they will never see the light of day. They will work until they're 100 years old and still never get out of debt. And they add more to it. It just adds more to it. And they raise their limit over yes. and over. Yes. And then the companies will come back to you and say, oh, well, we'll just refinance for a lower rate, and, and we'll help you with this, and, and, and they'll give you a lower rate for a period of time, and then it jumps back up with that compound interest. I'm telling you, it's a cycle. It's gotcha. Paul told Timothy, be content with what things you have. You don't like your car? Just, just thank God for the car that you got. Thank God that it's running and getting you from point A to point B. If you really got to have something else and you, and, and you really feel like you, you know, it's really uh, necessary for an upgrade, save your money and to where you can at least put a good down payment on it and, and then go get you a car. But don't go in there and let some sales guy who's slippery like oil talk you into uh, financing something that's going to put you into 7 to 10 years of debt. Right. Everyone with me this morning? Yeah. This is real life lessons, right? This is what they need to teach you guys in high school. They need to get rid of some of this 
uh, stuff that you're never going to use unless you go to a specific field, you know, like algebra. <laughs> they need to talk. I'm, I'm here to tell you, I'm, I'm getting ready to turn 43 next month. I have never used algebra outside of school, ever, not once. You know why? Because any situation that I was put in where I had to figure out something that was kind of resembling of that, it's on your phone now. They've got calculators. You can it'll do it for you. You don't need to memorize and learn all that stuff. But what they need to do is start saying, well, we're going to incorporate some how to balance a checkbook, right. how to pay your bills, how to set up a family budget, mm -hmm. how to iron your clothes, how to cook a homemade meal without burning the kitchen down, how to change your oil, how to change... Uh, come on, somebody. Real life stuff that you're going to need. Yeah. That's what they need to be teaching. That's right. Yeah, how to fix a leaking toilet. How to plunge that sucker when someone flushes a diaper down there and clogs it up. Praise <laughs> the Lord. Yeah, real life stuff. We, we closed in our home and we're so thankful for it. God really blessed us. And there were several times in this process we didn't know for sure that uh, it was going to happen. But, you know, uh, we endured and God just kept opening doors and we closed on our house. And we got in there, we found out that uh, I told my wife, I said, man, you can't trust anybody. It don't matter who they are. I said, I really should have went and, and, and paid that extra $600 for a home inspection. I was trying to save cost, but our level of trust, you know, they assured us everything was just, and, and we, we got in there and we was like, oh man, and we're going to have to replace this, we're going to have to do this, all that would have been flushed out in a home inspection. When you guys grow up and you start buying a home, you get that home inspection. I don't care if it's your brother or your sister selling you a house, you get that home inspection, okay? If they say, ah, oh, trust us. We've taken perfect care. Everything is great and peachy king. Oh, but in closing, when you're signing this, uh, you know, they, the lady was reading it at the speed of light. And uh, uh, this stood out to me very crystal clear. She said, by signing this statement, you agree that you have walked through the premises with the seller and concur that all repairs and remodels have been made and that there is nothing outstanding that is on the liability of the seller. I'm thinking, wait a minute, we did not do that. But they make you sign out a piece of paper anyway, saying that from henceforth, now that you've put your John Hancock on this piece of paper, you can't come back to the seller and say, why didn't you tell us this was not working right? Get that home inspection. It may take you a little while longer to close, but you get that home inspection. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But in all of, the, all of that, there's more blessings than there are aggravations. Amen. God has blessed us. Paul, Paul teaches this concept of being content, of being thankful with whatever you do have. Let me tell you something. I grew up poor. I grew up dirt poor. I wore hand-me-downs of hand-me-downs. Uh, my, my older brother would receive stuff from our cousins, and then it came down to me. Uh, we didn't have anything to speak of. And so I didn't know I was poor. I, I felt blessed. I was, I was a happy kid. I never realized I was poor until I got teased by other people at school. Uh, but so, so many people are chasing stuff. I remember riding the school bus. Does anybody here ride the school bus? I remember riding the school bus, and these little things, they were little rectangular, they were Nintendo something, Game Boys. Yeah, and they used to slide these little games in them, and people would be playing those, and, and uh, they used to like be little and make fun of those of the rest of us that could not afford those things. Well, my parents didn't have $200 to fork out to buy one of those little things. Back then, 200 was a lot of That's money. That's a lot of money. But the people who had that stuff, they liked to bring it around and flaunt it and show it and just kind of, you know, uh, kind of belittle those who did not have. But Paul says, if, if you're always chasing stuff, it's like piercing yourself through with arrows with many sorrows. He said, uh, people end up erring from the faith because what they have is never enough. What they have is never good enough. What they have 
they're not happy with it. They, 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 they've got to upgrade. They've got to have more. They've got to have better. And so it, it's just chasing the next upgrade. They're not content. And so that means they're discontent. That means they're not thankful, they're unthankful. And Paul says it's a, it's a trap, it's a trap that sucks you in and you can't get out of it. You're going to hurt yourself, you're possibly going to destroy yourself. You might even find yourself backsliding right. and erring from the faith in your pursuit of stuff. Let me give you an example of that. Somewhere between the North Pole and the South Pole, I knew a man that had a really good job and it, it paid a whole lot more money than I make. I'll, I'll say that. And you would think, well, that's, that should be plenty. That should be enough. You know, they get three kids, a wife, they had a nice house. You know, she didn't have to work because his bills were more, I mean, his income was more than enough. But then it was like, well, I, I need a motorcycle. And then that motorcycle wasn't good enough. It was like, eh, I want something bigger. I want something more cushy and more comfortable. So they trade that in and get an upgrade, and then it's like, well, I really want a boat, because I, I like going to the lake, I, I need a boat, and so they went out and bought this big old pontoon boat, and it was like, well, you know, if you got a boat, you got to have a trailer to pull the boat, and then you got to have something to pull the trailer to pull the boat, so I need to go buy myself a brand new extended cab F-250, or whatever it was, and, and so you get all this stuff, and so what are you going to do with this stuff when you're not working, and he's like, oh, well, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I just don't have time to go to church today, because I'm going to the lake. To spend some time on my brand new boat. I'm going to jump in my brand new truck, pull in my brand new trailer, pull in my brand new boat, and I'm going to spend the whole weekend at, uh, on the lake in my brand new boat. And then uh, when I get back home, I'm going to get on my brand new motorcycle and I'm going to go riding through the refuge and riding through the mountains. I'm sorry, then I, I just don't have time to come to church. That's the way it started. And then before you know it, you never saw this guy ever. A year passed, two years passed, three years passed. Time went on, this guy backslid and uh, started drinking and started cussing and started living uh, contrary to what he knew uh, was, the, was the will of God. And uh, it all happened just because he was pursuing stuff. Don't think that the Bible says this in vain, folks. The love of money is the root of all evil. It sucks you in. And it pulls you away from God. Right. There's nothing wrong with a the boat. There's nothing wrong with a the trailer. There's nothing wrong with a the truck. There's nothing wrong with a the lake. There's nothing wrong with a motorcycle. Right. But it's when those things become such an obsession that you just say, you know what? I'm not going to church this weekend or next weekend or the next week because I've got to go play with my stuff. Right. And that's what happened. And then... As much money as this guy was making because he had all this stuff, he started volunteering to work double shifts at his job because he's like, man, I'm having a hard time paying for all my new stuff. Even with the massive income he was already making. So he started working double shifts. And so he really didn't even have time for his family anymore, much less he never came to church, and he hardly ever had time for his stuff. Over time, he had to sell his stuff because he never had time to use it. That's what happens. That's the, that's the game. That's the cycle. That's why if we do things God's way, it's so much better. Right. Paul said, learn to be content with whatever things you have. And that doesn't mean that you can't strive for better. That doesn't mean that you can't strive you know, to improve or to get something nicer. But you've just got to have a balance in there. You've got to be careful because if your obsession is about getting the name brand clothes and getting those Michael Jordan sneakers and, and, and making sure that uh, you've got the best of the best and you've got the most recent upgrade. If, if, you, if you're constantly chasing that, it's a trap. And you're going to find yourself, possibly as Paul told Timothy, he says some have erred from the faith, some have backslid, some have walked away from God because they're so busy pursuing stuff. And maybe by the time they got in the middle of that trap, they realized that they were caught in a trap. But then they were stuck and couldn't do anything about it. They had to work two and three and four jobs just to pay for their stuff. Right. I've seen divorces occur out of situations like this. I have seen families and homes split up 
because people were so obsessed with stuff and more that not only did they not have time for a church and for God, but they didn't have time for their family either. And then relationships start to pull apart. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Paul tells us to be content with whatever things that we have. He said, with food and raiment, let us be content. So what if it's not the name brand shoes that you want? Do they fit? Do they keep you from walking barefoot? Then praise the Lord. Amen. So what if that's not, you know, the, the, the name brand jeans or, or, or shirt or dress or whatever it is that you're wearing? So what? Who cares? You know, if it's covering your body and it's keeping you warm as we're going into the cold winter months, then praise the Lord. Amen. Be happy about it. Be thankful that God has blessed you because I promise you, you can walk right outside of this building in this direction right now, and you're going to find one or two people laying on the ground. They've watered up their, their shirt as a pillow. They don't even have a coat. They don't have a pair of shoes. They don't have a home. They ain't got nothing to eat unless someone takes pity on them. Right, right outside that wall right there outside the Sunday school room. So the next, the next time we're, we're, we're wanting to say, well, this is okay, but I would really rather have this. Think about that. Paul said, whatever you have, whatever God has blessed you with, whatever condition or state that you find yourself in, praise the Lord about it. Count your blessings. Amen. I, I said I'm preaching today about unplugging so that we can get plugged in. We live in a world of constant distractions. We live in a world where people don't even know how to talk to each other anymore. We, we live in a world where people don't even sit down and have a conversation anymore. I, I see this all the time. I, I shake my head. I'm like, what in the world? People will be sitting two feet from one another texting each other. Instead of looking at each other, talking. Instead of saying, how was your day? Well, this is what's going on in my life. They would rather sit there and text or message or whatever platform they're using. People don't even know how to have a conversation anymore. They never look up from their iPad and their cell phones and their little games. They're just constantly glued. And when the battery goes dead on this one, they lay it down and pick up the next gadget. And they just think they, they waste their entire day. Plug in to something that isn't going to matter 10 years from now. That's right. When that technology is obsolete and you start telling your kids about that, they're going to like, oh. What is that? Never heard of that. That sounds ancient and old. And you laugh at us old people right now that you guys are going to find yourself in the same situation 10 years from now. <laughs> An iPhone? Oh my goodness, how yesterday. That's what people are going to do to you. An iPad? Oh my goodness, just grow a tail and call yourself a dinosaur. I'm, I'm here to tell you technology changes so fast, it's outdated before it ever leaves the shelf. But people are so plugged into stuff that does not matter, that is irrelevant, that they don't even have meaningful conversations. They don't even facilitate relationships with other people. The only relationships that they have are with pretend online people that they've never even laid eyes on or met. Some 55-year-old bald-headed, big-bellied guy named Bob is over in North Dakota claiming to be a 16-year-old girl named Susie trying to play uh, some kind of online game with you and sending you friend requests and wanting to connect and learn more about you. I'm here to tell you, that's the world that we live in. We need to learn to unplug. I'm not saying you need to throw away your Xbox or your Nintendo and your iPhone and your iPad, but I do think that it would be good, and everyone close your eyes right now. Everyone close your eyes right now. Okay, everyone got it closed? Ask yourself, say, self, have I picked up my Bible and read it this week? Now, only you and God know the answer to that. But if the answer is no, and you know that you have spent plenty of hours this week playing these stupid little games on your electronic devices, that is a surefire indicator you need to unplug. That's right. That's right. If you have not bent a knee and prayed to God once this week, if you have not opened the pages of your Bible and spent any time reading this week, 
but you've spent all your time Facebook messaging and Instagram messaging and texting and, and playing online games and you've, you've had all the time in the world for that, but you've never had any time for Jesus. It's time to get unplugged. That's right. It's time to cut the cord. It's time to get back to real life, reality, what really matters. That's right. Amen. Amen. The longer I live, I, I, I feel I feel I so obsolete. Question. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. How about use those devices to listen to the Bible? Yes. Or to lectures that we find on YouTube. Exactly. Exactly. And so technology itself is not bad. It's not. These are tools that we can and do use for good things, for good reasons. And you can use them, use them for spiritual purposes. But 99% of the time, I think it's safe to say people are binge playing Candy Crush and Angry Birds and all these little idiotic retarded games that I look at and I'm like, what is that? I don't understand what they're doing. What? I'm lost. I, I don't even understand. People spend hours every single day plugged in to the irrelevant and they never get plugged in to the meaningful. Jesus said, if you abide in me and I in you, you shall bear forth much fruit. Amen. But he said, no branch that refuses to abide and stay connected to me can even live. It's going to shrivel up and die and be cast into the fire. That is a warning, folks. And we can't spend all of our time on the unnecessary and the irrelevant and not have time for Jesus. Right. We've got to find a happy balance. We've got a balance. We say, well, if I'm going to spend an hour on Facebook today, I sure enough better have time to squeeze a good chunk of time in today for Jesus. If I'm going to spend all this time playing uh, Tetris and Angry Birds and Candy Crush and um, whatever it is, you know, if I, if I have four hours to do that and I say I don't have time to pray or read my Bible, you're lying to yourself. That's right. We need to unplug from the irrelevant. Because I'm here to tell you something. I'm here to tell you something. And I'm not trying to be negative. I'm, I'm trying to help us because Jesus is about to come and the church is getting ready to make our grand exit. There's going to be a whole lot of people left behind that thought they were going to heaven. Yes, there is. There's going to be a whole lot of people that thought, well, I'm going to fly out of here on, on, you know, on wings of glory and I'm going to go home and walk on streets of gold and live forever with Jesus. And they're going to miss the rapture of the church. And you know why? Because they don't have a prayer life. Because they never read the Bible. Because they never pray. They don't stay connected to Jesus. They got all the time in the world to connect to stupid stuff on YouTube. And stuff that's irrelevant and is not beneficial to them. They'll spend hours every single day of the week wasting life. And never plug into Jesus. That's right. I'm here to tell us today. Sir, man, you hear me. It's time to unplug. So that we can get plugged in. Right. If you don't have a prayer life, you need to unplug some devices and let the batteries die. And you need to say, while it's dead, I'm going to go pray. While it's dead, I'm going to go read my Bible. While it's dead, I'm going to go to church. While it's dead, I'm going to spend some time praising and worshiping the Lord. Angry birds can't do nothing for you. Tetris can't do nothing for you. Gold miner can't do All these stupid games you download, they can't do nothing for you. You're wasting life away. That's right. Amen. You're wasting brain cells. Besides, that's what the devil wants too. That's right. Create a distraction from distraction. what's important. That's exactly right. He's getting us distracted. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Well, what were they doing? It says they were marrying, giving in marriage, and eating and drinking, went about their daily life. They were just living. They were just killing time. All of a sudden. But the book of Hebrews tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. See, everyone thinks Noah just built an ark. He was a preacher of righteousness. Because while he's building... And everyone's like, what is this rain business? It has never rained. We don't even know what rain is. We've never seen that before. Always before, it was a mist that came up from the ground. It had never rained. You read your Bible. It had never rained, ever, once. Until God opened the windows of heaven. And the rain didn't just come from above. 
The Bible says that the water tables of the ground underneath burst open, and the water came from below too. They were literally swallowed up from the top and the bottom. They were sandwiched together to drowning to their death. They were just killing time. And, and while, while Noah's building this ark, he's telling people, God said he's going to send a flood. He's going to kill every living thing. And so we've got to make preparations. We've got to get ready. Judgment is coming. We need to get ready. And he told me to build an ark. So I'm here to tell you the first time you feel a rain droplet hit your head, you need to make a mad dash for this ramp and get on this boat that I'm building. And nobody listened to him. Just like some of you may not listen to Pastor G here this morning. You may say, well, that was a good message. I appreciate that. Now when I go, to go home today, I'm going to spend four or five hours on Candy Crush until I go to bed. Some of y'all ain't going to listen to me. But you better listen to me. Amen. Because they didn't listen to Noah. That's right. And the only people on planet Earth out of the millions of people that existed was eight souls. That's right. Eight people. Everybody else perished in the floodwaters. Right. And I just kind of in my mind's eye see that as the floodwaters begin to rise, as the rain is pouring down and the water tables broke open and the water swallowed them up from beneath, that people that knew Manoah, they were trying to get to the ark. While they're trying to wade through water that's chest high and they're trying to bang on the side of that saying, please let us in. We believe you now. We believe you now. But the problem is God had already shut the door of the ark. Not Noah. Not Noah. Not Noah. God shut it. That's right. And let me tell you something. Jesus gives us the analogy of the rapture of the church. He likens the church to ten virgins. He says five were ready and five were not ready. And he said, when the announcement came that the bridegroom was coming, those that were ready, those five, they went with him. While the other five were off doing other things. They were looking for oil. They were looking for stuff. And so they tried to come after the fact, and they knocked on the door after Jesus had shut the door. They said, please let us in. And he said, I don't know you. That's right. Depart from me. See, a lot of people think they're going to go to heaven and be saved, but they don't even pray. They don't even read their Bible. They don't have a walk in relationship with God. But they got all the time in the world for digital distractions. I'm here to tell us today, you listen to Pastor G from a heart full of love. Unplug that demonic garbage. Amen. It may not be a sin, but it is a weight. And it is distracting you from a walk in a relationship with God. Jesus is coming. And the church is getting ready to leave. And if you are not ready, you will miss the rapture and you will be lost. I'm telling, I'm telling you the truth today. you got to unplug. Amen. It's okay to use social media. I use social, it's okay to play games. It's okay to use these things. But not to the extent where you say, well, I just binged on this for the last four or five, six hours playing these stupid little games. And I, just, I didn't have time to read my Bible today. I didn't have time to pray. I'm talking to some people right now. Amen. You see, every service when we... Get ready to turn the lights off and close the door. I look and I see Bibles left here that don't go with the owner. So unless you've got a second or third copy at home that you're reading, ain't no Bible reading going on during the week. That's right. Pastor Jesus is talking where the rubber reads the road. I'm being real right now. Amen. You see, this is your sword, and this is the only weapon we have in our arsenal. So how are you going to arm yourself for spiritual battle if you leave your sword in the armory? You need to put it on and carry it with you. You need to take this thing home with you and read it at home. You say, well, I can read my Bible on my cell phone. Yes, you can. But I can read my you? Bible on my iPad. Yes, you can. There's apps for that. Yes, there is. The question is, do you? Do you? I like this. This is my amen corner this morning. <laughs> amen. Everybody, close your eyes and point to your chest. And like Sister Doc, I just said, say, do you? Do you? Do you? Do you? Only you and God know the answer to that, but if you say, no, I'm not, then I encourage you to start doing it. Amen. Go home today and make a fresh commitment to God. Say, I'm going to start reading my Bible before I pick up an Xbox controller. I'm going to start reading my Bible before I pick up my iPad. You see, there's an addiction to all this stuff, folks. There really is. If the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning and you open your eyeballs and you're thinking... Am I dead or alive? I can't tell. <laughs> and you're like, oh, well, I'm moving, so I must be alive. 
If your next reflex is to reach over for your phone or your digital device, your iPad, whatever it is, and to pull it over in front of your face and to see what notifications you got and who is messaging you and who's not and what's going on in the world and then automatically flipping into your game, if that's the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning, you're not ready for the rapture. That's right. You can throw rocks at me if you want to. And I'm here to tell you, if that's the first thing that you do, you're not ready for the rapture. Amen. You need to put God first. That's right. Amen. Jesus said that there are two great commandments that make up all of the law. Love God with your all. All your mind, heart, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. But God comes before your neighbor. God comes before everything else. But so if you put anything else before God, you're not loving him first and you're not loving him with all. Amen. At best, some people love him with some. But definitely not all. But some people don't love God at all because they never make time for Jesus in their daily agenda. That's right. Is this okay? Amen. Anyone hating and upset with Pastor G this morning? I'm trying to help us to make sure that we're ready for the rapture of the church. Amen. Because Jesus could come today. This could be the last service that we ever congregate here at Great Plains Apostolic Church. The trump of God could sound. Jesus could come back in the clouds of glory. And those that are ready to meet him be caught out of here in a moment and twinkling of an eye. And it could all be done. All and be that's done. That's exactly what the apostles need with too. That's right. They're always waiting for Jesus to come like the next hour. The, the next, next hour. hour. The but, next hour. And that's how they leave. And that's the way we need to live. We need to live. Uh, Brother, Brother George Malloy, he pastors Heavenway Apostolic Church on the west side of town. Good friend of mine. I love him. I appreciate him. He says this all the time. He says, you need to live every day ready to die or ready to fly. Yep. Every day. Don't get distracted with the iPhones and the Androids and the iPads and the Xboxes and the Nintendos and whatever the gadgets are. Don't get so distracted and consumed with that that you don't have time for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Don't get so locked into texting and messaging people and, 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 and whatever uh, is going on. With all that. Don't, don't, get, don't spend so much time on all that that you never take time to pray and read, and read your word. Amen. Because you don't want Jesus to to tell you whenever you start knocking saying can I go to heaven too hey I thought I was God what about me I thought I, was, I thought I was saved I thought I was going to heaven you don't want to see the door shut in your face and you're out on the outside knocking and hey, let me in he's going to say I don't know who you I don't know you we never had a relationship don't mistake coming to church for a relationship with God that's right Coming to church is part of your walk in relationship with God, but it is not a substitute for a home prayer life and a daily devotion, spending time in the Word of God. We know these things. We know these things. But are we doing these things? The only way that we're going to grow, the only way that we're going to bear spiritual fruit is to stay connected to Jesus. And if we don't stay connected to Jesus, we cannot flourish. We cannot be anointed. We cannot hear from God. We cannot be used of God. And we cannot bear forth good fruit. You say, what's the meaning of all the, uh, the fruit? I'll preach this another day for you sometime. But Jesus gave this analogy. He gave this parable. And he said, he compared himself to a husbandman. And he said, I had a vineyard. And he said, uh, the owner went into the vineyard. And he, and he found a tree that had no fruit on it. And he told the keeper of the vineyard, he said, you cut that tree down and Get it out of here because it's just taking up space. He says, I've been coming and looking at this tree for three years in a row, and there's nothing on it still. And the keeper of the vineyard begged and pleaded, and he said, Give me one more year, Lord. One more year. I'll dig around it, I'll fertilize it, I'll give it special attention, and special care, and we'll see if we can get some fruit growing on this thing. And if it doesn't happen this year, I'll cut it down and then we'll throw it in the fire. Jesus is looking for fruit. Amen. And he's serious about it. And the only way we can bear spiritual fruit is to have a walk in a relationship with God and allow the Holy Ghost to produce things in us that God desires to see. That's right. Carnality. Paul said that no sin is going to enter into heaven. 
And the carnal man, uh, it's our sinful nature. We, we can't just float through uh, life not having a walk in a relationship with God and think that we're going to make the rapture. We're not. Uh, is this okay today? Amen. Y'all know I just, I'm just straight. A lot of people ain't going to tell you the truth. and They're just going to tell you what you want to hear. But I, you come here, I'm going to tell you the truth. Amen. I Jesus, have a question. Yes, ma'am. What are these fruits? The fruits? Paul talks about goodness and meekness and gentleness and peace and uh, brotherly kindness. Uh, several others there in Ephesians. And I'll get you that scripture. But these are the things that the Holy Ghost produces within an individual. Amen. And they are a direct contrast to the works of the flesh. So you can't have the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit at the same time. You gotta get rid of one. That's why Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon. You just can't do it. You can't do it. You've got to let one of them go. And so if we're gonna make heaven our home, we've got to unplug from some things that if we're to be honest with ourselves, they're distractions. And so that we can get plugged into Jesus. Amen? Amen. I'm gonna say this and then uh we're going to hurry to a close here real quickly. I read in Luke chapter number 17, there were 10 lepers that came to Jesus. And I want you to notice something. Jesus didn't even lay his hands on these people. He didn't even touch this particular group. There were other lepers that he did touch. But he didn't touch these ones. He saw them coming, and Jesus told him, he said, go show yourself to the priests. He saw them coming to him by faith. He said, go show yourself to the priests. As Moses commanded me. So nine of them did a about face and they turned and they, they walked all the way uh, to the temple to show themselves to the priest and say, we've been healed. They did exactly what Jesus told them to do. One of that ten, as he was going with the other nine, he noticed, he looked down and he said, I've been healed. Now, to be healed means that the leprosy is gone. But leprosy is a skin-eating disease, and there's been some uh, contradictory statements over leprosy, but every encyclopedia, every dictionary that I've ever read says that leprosy is contagious. I've, I've had some people come back and say that leprosy is not contagious at all, but it is. They have leper colonies, and that's why Jesus, uh, in his word, commanded the lepers to live outside the camp. They were considered unclean. They were not allowed to live among everyone else because they didn't want it to spread. They had special cleansing procedures for their homes, uh, you know, and, and all of this and that. They had to burn stuff with fire. And leprosy is contagious. The skin eating disease, it eats your nose off, it eats your fingers off, it eats your toes off, it eats your limbs off, it eats your ears off, it eats your face off, until finally you die of some kind of infection. It's a slow, painful killer. And you look like a monster by the time it has eaten you and destroyed you. And we think that this disease does not exist in our world today, but it still exists in third world countries. It does. It's still very prevalent. And so here in the United States of America, we're blessed. Tell your neighbor, say, we're blessed. And this one guy, he noticed that he was healed. The leprosy was gone. Now, all, all ten of these guys, they walked away and their leprosy was gone because Jesus had healed them. He said, go show yourself to the priest as Moses commanded you, as my word instructs you. So, missing some fingers and toes and ears and parts of their face and their nose, parts of their body, they were hobbling all the way to the priest to say, the leprosy is gone, we're healed. Now we're going to go home to our loved ones different than when we first contracted this thing. Some of us with missing fingers, some of us with missing toes, some of us with missing body parts because leprosy took it. The leprosy's gone, but the body parts are still gone too. But one guy out of that bunch, he saw that the leprosy was gone, and he did another about face. He turned and he went all the way back to Jesus. He fell down at the feet of Jesus, and he worshipped him with a loud voice. I'm here to tell you something. There's something powerful about worshiping God out loud with your voice. Amen. Amen. He fell on his face and he worshiped Jesus with a loud voice when he saw that he was healed. And Jesus says, where's the other nine? They're not grateful for what I did for them. They're not thankful for what I did for them. He said, 
Just one stranger here, just one Samaritan has returned to give God glory. And he said, because you come back by faith and you worship, he said, I'm going to give you your fingers back. I'm going to give you your toes back. You're going to get your missing body parts back. Not only are you healed, but you are whole. Amen. That's right. Mm. That's right. See, there's something about praise and worshiping God. There's something about getting unplugged from distractions and plugging into Jesus because when you get a thankful heart, when you get the heart that says, I'm content with what God has blessed me with, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm counting my blessings, I'm thankful. I'm not living in the month of thanksgiving. I'm living every day in a mindset of thanks living. Amen. God's people are a thankful people. And when we get that in our mind and heart and say, I may not have the best of the best, but God has still blessed me. Amen. And I'm thankful for what I do have and I'm content. Amen. And you get a heart full of thanksgiving and you worship God. See, God has a way of giving you things back that other people don't get back. Amen. Oh, they may be healed, but they're not made whole. Amen. But it's those that have a heart full of thankfulness. It's those who have a spirit of contentment. It's those who make up their mind, I'm going to worship God. I'm going to give God glory. I'm going to yeah. praise Him. Hallelujah. I'm going to worship Him. I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to plug into Jesus. Jesus says, I'm going to give you something. I didn't give the rest of them. He said, the rest of them left healed, but I'm giving you all your phalanges back. I'm giving you your missing nose and ears and body parts. He says, I'm going to make you completely whole. That's not the first time Jesus did that. There was a man by the name of Naaman, and he had uh, some military troops under him. A man and the man of God, uh, you know, uh, Naaman came to him one day, and he, he thought that, uh, that the man of God was going to come out and lay his hands on him and do something supernatural, and he never even left the house. He never even opened the door and came out. He just said, you're telling him to go dip in the River Jordan seven times. And Naaman left that place offended. He said, I thought he would at least come and look me in the eyes. I thought he'd at least come and shake my hand. I thought maybe he'd come and lay his hands on me and get all excited and bend me backwards like a pretzel and, and make a big hoopla so that I would receive my miracle. And this guy won't even leave his house. He sent his servant to tell me to go dip in a muddy river, Jordan. He said, there's better rivers in my, my homeland. There's better rivers around here that are clean. They're not muddy like that. But the servants, they begin to tell him, they say, Master, if it had been something hard that he would ask you to have done, would you not have done it? Are you not ready to be made whole? Are you not so desperate for God to move and intervene and remove this disease and this condition from your life? Are you not so desperate and sick and tired of being sick and tired? You're willing to do whatever it takes he just asked you to go dip seven times in that muddy river Jordan down there. So finally Naaman goes down there and he dips in once and he comes up out of there. And that muddy river, all that water is running in his sores. Because remember, leprosy eats away your body and your body parts. And, and so the muddy water is getting in his sores. I'm sure that it stings. How many's ever had a cut and you got something in it? Doesn't it sting? Imagine muddy water getting in open wounds and sores. He comes up out there. He's probably thinking, oh, this hurts. Oh, this is miserable. Nothing. Nothing. And he goes down in the water again, and he comes up the second time. Nothing. Just more pain and more agitation in his sores. He does that the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth time. Finally, he goes down in the River Jordan the seventh time, and as he comes up out of the water, God gave him a brand new body. Boom. Every missing body part was restored. Right. Every sore was made whole. That's he had right. brand new skin just like a baby. God made him whole because he obeyed by faith. Amen. I'm here to tell us today that God has a way of giving his people back things that not everybody else gets. Right. If you have a heart of thankfulness, Amen. if you have a heart of contentment, if you have a heart that says, you know what? I'm going to praise and worship and magnify my Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to connect to Him. I'm going to unplug with some other things because I see my need, amen, to get connected to Jesus. He's all that I need. He's all that I need. He's the giver of life. He's my joy, my strength. He's the peace giver. Amen. He's the way maker. He's the storm calmer. He's everything that I need. I need to connect with Him. Amen. 
We're going to hurry to a close here, right here. The spirit of Jezebel is an unthankful, prideful, controlling, and complaining spirit. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't be complaining. Don't be complaining. It is as stubborn and resilient as cancer. That's right. The spirit of Jezebel is as resilient and stubborn as cancer. See, sometimes when someone gets cancer and they go through the chemo and they go through the treatments and they get sick and, and their body is made weak and, and they're going through that, they lose all of their hair and, and, and they just seem like a, 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 a shell of who they were while they're trying to attack this cancer. And a lot of times the doctors, after all this treatment is done, the doctors will say, well, we caught it early enough. We did all the treatments. It looks like we got it in remission. We got this thing under control. We've got cancer kept at bay. We're just going to do regular monitoring and checkups to make sure that it stays at bay. But then all of a sudden, it comes back with a vengeance. And it's aggressive. And it spreads to critical areas of your body. And the next thing you know, it's stage four, and you got two weeks to live, and you better get your house in order, because cancer comes back like that. The spirit of Jezebel operates just like that. It is an unthankful, it's a prideful, controlling, complaining spirit. And if you do not work intentionally to keep it at bay, it has a way of coming back, and coming back more aggressively. Coming, it's, it's a stubborn spirit, it's a prideful spirit, that's the way that it works. And the only way to keep that spirit away and at bay is to have a thankful, content, humble heart. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. Everyone stay with me today? Amen. Amen. Yes. If all that thing ever comes out of your mouth is complaints and grumbling and mumbling because this ain't good enough and, you know, uh, this is okay, but I'd rather have this. I'd rather do this. I'd rather place this, I'd rather, you know, the, you know, I need this upgrade, I need this upgrade. If you're never content with what God blesses you with, don't expect him to bless you with more. That's right. Amen. They got quiet on me right now. That doesn't mean I close, I mean that big. If all you do is grumble and complain about the blessings of God in your life, don't expect him to bless you with more. That's right. Yeah. That's right. If all you do is grumble and complain about the blessings of God in your life, don't expect Him to give you more. Amen. Don't expect Him to give you an upgrade if you're complaining about the downgrade. Amen. Amen. Be content with whatever God has blessed you with. You say, well, this is, you know, uh, this, this is functional, but it's, you know, it's not quite, uh, you know, as good as it should be. Well, just praise God for what you got right now, and maybe God will bless you with an upgrade later on. Amen. Learn to be thankful. Amen. Learn to be content. Amen. And learn to praise God anyway. Amen. Instead of getting frustrated, instead of getting angry, instead of giving place to gripe and complain, and just praise the Lord at all times, and God will give you an upgrade in the process of time Amen. through patience. Amen. Amen. This is something the millennial generation, I think, and it's, it's our fault, the Generation Xers. We can't blame, it, blame the baby boomers. We always want to let, blame the grandparents, but in this case, it wasn't the grandparents. It was my generation. Not necessarily me and my wife, but we beat our kids. <laughs> but our generation, we were the idiots that said, everybody gets a trophy, whether you win or lose. Matter of fact, you don't even have to show up to the game. You can stay at home and play your little Nintendo, and we'll bring you a trophy because we don't want anyone's feelings to be hurt. We want everyone to feel included. <laughs> it was our generation that developed this stupid thing called safe spaces. How many of you remember when President Trump got elected in 2016 that all these colleges and universities and corporations left their employees and students off uh, for so many days to grieve and to mourn and they were able to go weep and cry like little babies in safe spaces. <laughs> now, I'm this is real stuff, guys. I know. That's true. It My generation created that nonsense. We want to wrap everybody in bubble wrap. We don't want anybody's feelings to be hurt. We don't want anyone to be unhappy. And we created a very fragile and totally messed up generation that doesn't know how to cope with real life. And when they don't get what they want, as you can see, turn on any news network that you see. They 
storm the streets and the cities and they set buildings on fire and they break the windows and they loot stores and they take what they want and they pull people out of vehicles and they beat them half to death and they're shooting people it's because they never learn the concept of being told no. That's right. You can't have that. No, you can't do that. No, you will not go there. You will listen to me or I'm going to pull off my belt and sweat your little bottom. That's right. They were never taught boundaries and discipline. And we raised an entire generation that's about to bring America down to her knees. That's right. Yeah. Spoiled. True. My generation did that. Yeah. That's right. My hope is with the generation Y. It's Gen Z. Z. I get lost in the alphabet. I have no idea what the generation it is at right now. So you're yeah. good. Yeah. I think Y is the millennials, right? I have no idea, Pastor. Yes. I think yours is Generation Z. That, that, that's my hope right there. I'm hoping that they look at their parents and they're thinking, my God, they done lost their ever loving marbles. They have to have safe spaces. Anytime anyone tells them no, they blow up and start shooting people and <laughs> shooting movie theaters and marching into churches and shooting everybody and burning, burning police officers to the ground because somebody told them no. And they, they, they don't know how to handle real life. I'm not going to be like that. I'm going to be a man and a woman. I'm going to be an adult. Amen. That's my hope for Generation Z. They, they look at that and say, you know what? Everybody doesn't get a trophy. You show up to the game and you play, and if you win, you get a trophy. If you lose, you don't go home and suck your thumb. You say, well, I just trained harder and hopefully do better next time. That's real life. That's right. That's real life. That's right. Amen. We've got to unplug to get plugged into the right source. That's right. Amen. How many knows that we need to get plugged into Jesus? Amen. 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 Can we close our, head, our eyes and bow our heads all across this place right now? I want us to pray right where we're seated right now. Amen. I don't know where you're at, where you're living. Amen. Only you and God know where you're at today. I would encourage you that if your Bible is sitting beside you on your chair today, take it home with you. Amen. And I want you to open the pages of that Bible, and I want you to spend some time reading it this week. Amen. A little less social media. A little less texting, a little less messaging, a little less digital games and digital distractions, a little more Jesus. I'm not saying get rid of all of that. I'm just saying you've got to have a fine balance, and Jesus has to come first. If you know within your heart that that's not the case for you right now, I'm not here to condemn anybody. I'm just giving you a little nudge in the right direction. And I'm challenging you to make a commitment right now to God in prayer. Saying, Jesus, I'm going to leave this place today. And I'm going to get plugged in. I'm going to get plugged into you, Lord. I'm going to get serious about my home prayer life. I'm going to get serious about spending time reading the Word of God. It's not going to sit here lonely all week long on a chair at the church and wondering why I didn't go home with me for me to read it. I'm going to take that Bible home and I'm going to read it. I'm going to study it. I'm going to hide it in my heart. Jesus, I'm going to get plugged into you. I'm going to get plugged into you. Is there anybody that this is resonating, amen, with your spirit today? Would you lift your hands and commit to the Lord? Amen. Say, Lord, I've been, I've been operating at such and such capacity. But, Lord, I'm going to go a little bit further. I'm making an intentional commitment, Lord, to get plugged into you. Lord, to unplug from the digital distractions a little more so that I can spend more time in your presence. That I can spend more time in prayer. That I can spend more time in your word because, God... Lord, without you, I can do nothing. Without you, Lord, I have nothing. Without you, Lord, I am nothing. But through you, Lord, I can do all things. Oh, in the name of Jesus, somebody lift your voice to the Lord right now. Hallelujah. This is a time of consecration. This is a time of, of coming back and making a fresh commitment to the Lord. Jesus is calling us back to building altars in our homes. He's calling us back to daily devotions in his word. Amen. Every day of the week. It's okay to unplug from the digital stuff for a little while so that you can plug into Jesus. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just for another couple minutes, lift your voice to the Lord. Amen. Amen. If you feel this today, amen, just tell the Lord that you're making a commitment. Amen. And as you leave this place today, you're going to be more intentional about plugging in the hymn. Amen. And if you'll do that, you'll see your worship begin to change. You'll see, amen, the presence of God moving in your life in a greater capacity. You'll see God moving on your behalf more mightily, amen, more clearly. Amen, a lot of confusion, a lot of conflict, a lot of things that's going on that you don't understand. You're going to start seeing the hand of God in it. If you'll plug into him, if you'll plug into him. Hallelujah. Would you let your voice out all across this place? Amen. Just for a preaching to myself, I'm preaching to all of us here today. Amen. The Bible is intentional about what it declares. Paul tells us to put on the whole armor of God. Why does he do that? Because it makes for a nice Sunday school lesson? No. Because we're in a war. Amen. And every day you're under attack. Amen. Your family's under attack. The devil wants to take you to hell with him. Amen. And he is not playing games. You got to get dressed for success. You got to put on that whole armor of God when you pray. Amen. Put God first yeah. in your life. Be intentional about connecting with Him. I promise you, you will see a greater anointing. You'll see the hand of God moving and operating. Amen. And blessing. If you're feeling conflict in your home and you're seeing in, in a dynamic of relationships, you're starting to see a lot of agitation and a lot of pushback and lashing out. It's because God is moving. God is working. He's, he's working in people's hearts. He's giving them a change of mind and a change of heart. But what you got to do is just, amen, stay connected to God. Yeah. It's going to be a bumpy ride. But when the ride gets to the end, amen, you're going to see the hand of God, how God worked it all out. Amen. We're going to see unsaved loved ones saved sitting beside us on these chairs coming in the house of God. But we got to do what we got to do. Amen. Stay plugged in to Jesus. Unplug so you can get plugged in. Someone say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Someone say glory to God. Glory to God. Turn to your neighbor and say, you look good. You look good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Love y'all. Appreciate y'all. Everyone is invited to come over to our house. Um, once we get closed up and everything, you can just make your way over there now, or you can come over here in the next hour or so, whatever you feel like doing. And uh, we're going to build us a fire in the fire pit. We're going to make s'mores and hot dogs and all that good stuff. And and uh, we're going to pray over our house. We're going to invite you to come. We're going to pray over our, our new house. And we're just going to have a good time today. Amen. Amen. So we want everyone to come. Amen. God bless you. We love you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, I'm